Okay, uh, hi everybody. Um, uh, there's me, I'm David Coleman, Stream Network's Office of the CTO, uh, Director of Wireless. I uh, know a lot of you people here, glad to be back here in Prague. It's been, what, three years? The last one was great, so I'm really glad to be back here. I think I'm supposed to stand back on this X. Um, also, wrote a book, in case you're not aware. And um, yeah, I'm not gonna do Where's Westcott anymore. We've determined he's not a real person. Um, the, um, uh, I do wanna plug this blog I wrote recently about the adverse health effects of Wi-Fi. That comes up all the time. We all know that Wi-Fi is not going to kill you or may and won't you know, cause baldness. Um, uh, I actually stole, a uh, from with Keith's permission, uh, a really cool analogy he uses, and maybe um, he'll talk about, use that analogy later up here on stage, it's up to him. But um, anyway, so I, I get asked this question all the time and, and wanted to make the counter arguments and, uh, and have a little fun with it about it causing baldness, but then I started thinking about it. And um, so maybe, you know, who knows? Um, but now, my topic today is the one that has been a topic now for a, a couple years now, and uh, we start, first started talking about six gigahertz. Um, I just wanna uh, mention to everybody here that we first started talking about 802.11ax about five years ago. Um, and surprisingly, <laughs> believe it or not, I can't believe I'm saying this, 802.11ax technology in the wild is now three years mature, okay? And of course, it was uh, the physical layer and Mac layer enhancements for better traffic management. You've all learned about them. We're not gonna go over all the different mechanisms. And obviously it operated in the 2.4 and five gigahertz band. And starting this past year um, in the six gigahertz band. And that's once again gonna be the focus of this presentation. I'm gonna cover some of the same things I did for some of you uh, people in Phoenix, but then I'm actually gonna add some new things uh, that we've learned in six months. And in addition, I'll try to put a little bit more of a European flavor to this as well. So um, this got started, we all know, in the United States, we got 1200 megahertz of frequency space for Wi-Fi using 802.11ax technology. Um, not as much here in Europe. Okay, uh, at least for now, you guys all know that you only have the Uni 5 band, 480 megahertz of frequency space. Um, that's great. If you think about it, that's about the same amount of space as 5 gigahertz. So that's better than nothing, right? However, uh, it's my contention, we want more. Okay, and uh, you know, Fernay was up, up here kind of talking about that, and him and I were both at the uh, Wi-Fi Now conference in Sweden a, a couple of weeks ago, and I'll say that uh, you know there was a lot of talk about spectrum harmonization um, and how important it's going to be, especially here in Europe. So uh, next year in 2023, Etsy and, and all the regulators in Europe, they're gonna meet again and they're gonna discuss the possibility about getting more frequency space. There's going to be a lot of heated arguments from incumbents and of course the Wi-Fi community and, and people like ourselves that are, are um, advocating for it. So uh, let's keep our fingers crossed. Let's hope that it, um, we do get more uh, spectrum space. And, uh, and, um, and why it's important, I'll quote Edgar from the Wi-Fi Alliance, who I think his last week on the job is next, uh, next week, he's retiring. We owe that man a, a great deal. He's done a lot for the Wi-Fi industry. Um, he, he kept speaking about the digital divide. And if we have uh, a lot of regions and countries where we only have 480 megahertz, but then other parts of the world, 1200 megahertz, is kind of causing a digital divide. And I totally agree with them. So we should all try to lobby and push, you know, within the legal boundaries to try to get as much frequency space as we can. It's been proven time and time again that unlicensed, uh, opening up unlicensed frequency space uh, for use the economic impact is nothing short of phenomenal. It will generate billions, it's going to generate billions of dollars into the global worldwide economy. Now, uh, you've probably all seen the rules, power rules as well, but uh, this is constantly changing too because it's different in every region as well. And that's the other thing. And it also will actually, in my mind, actually have some impact in terms of design and, and performance. So these are the rules for the United States in terms for, um, 
uh, LPI devices. There are as many as eight different classes of devices. We're not going to go over all of them. Uh, the two that we'll focus on are LPI, low power indoor, and standard power. The low power indoor are specifically for that. They're meant to be used only indoors, so you do not use them outdoors and do not interfere with the existing incumbents. Now, for APs, there's, uh, in addition to uh, very specific power rules, uh, you cannot use a weatherized enclosure. You cannot also have detachable antennas. That has implications for certain verticals that we'll talk about later on. Um, and also, there's lower power for clients as well. Um, there's these new power spectral density rules that I'll circle back to. And you'll also notice there's about a 6 dB difference between clients and APs in the United States. That actually has uh, some impact. Now, the rules are different in Europe. Um, you don't have the maximum power that you can use in Europe, uh, the, the EIRP is lower, um, but the power spectral density rules are a little bit different, and they're also um, equal. Um, so uh, there's not that, um, which means there's actually not a six, you can also notice there's not that six dB difference between clients and APs, and that actually ha could have some potential impact as opposed to what we're seeing a little bit in the United States between downlink and uplink. Okay, you don't necessarily have quite the issue you do here um, uh, that, that uh, in an, oh, we, here in Europe that we do in the United States. Um, and once again, you only have Uni5, but let's hope that there's harmonization. It doesn't necessarily have to be harmonization on the power rules, but we definitely want to try to get as much spectrum space opened as possible. Okay, now. Outdoor, so right now, it's very important to understand six gigahertz right now, it's only an indoor play. There is no outdoor Wi-Fi right now for six gigahertz. Now that will start changing, we think, next year, finally. But only in the United States. Right now, and it's going to be using standard, what are called standard power devices. Now, this isn't even really in the roadmap yet in the, most of the regulators in Europe yet. But once again, we're hoping that they're going to look at standard power in Europe and other regions as well, um, because you're going to need it for outdoors. And by the way, we also, we, uh, Extreme Networks, and by the way, all our competitors, okay, um, are all in total agreement that we believe that there's a huge play for a lot of different verticals um, for standard power indoors as well. And so there's a lot of lobbying going on to, to that effect as well. Now, um, once this happens, okay, and it'll happen, we thank Q2 uh, uh, in the, uh, next year for the United States, but that could change, all right? But once it happens, um, these are the, you're not going to be able to use as, as much frequency space. Um, once again, we don't know what's going to happen in Europe yet. Uh, you can use weatherized enclosures and you can also use uh, detachable antennas, but it also requires automated frequency uh, coordination, which I'm sure by now most of you are familiar with, which uh, basically an AP has to check in which, with is what is known as an automated frequency coordinated uh, provider, uh, AFC provider, and report its GPS coordinates, its height, its elevation, uh, a level of uncertainty. The whole point is so that it, uh, the APs will check in and request a channel. And uh, it's checked against a known database of incumbents that are already uh, transmitting outdoors, mostly fixed satellite services, and to make sure that you do not interfere with the incumbents. Uh, and then the AP also has to check in once a day. Now, this is nothing new. This technology has been used in CBRS and, and cellular for a long time, but now it's going to be used uh, in Wi-Fi. It hasn't totally been all fleshed out. But you know what's different uh, about this? This is proactive, right? Now, if you think about DFS in 5 gigahertz, that's reactive, right? So a radar event happens, and then you have to jump and change channels. And I think the last time I was here in Prague, we did a whole hour on DFS, right? If, if I, which is still cool technology as well, but completely different kind of approach. Uh, proactive to make sure you're not interfering instead of reactive. Um, now, uh, this still hasn't been totally fleshed out in the United States either, um, but once this does happen, um, 
uh, our APs will be able to check in and find out uh, whether or not uh, they can use particular channels. And if a channel is not available, the AFC provider can also recommend a channel in power settings as well. So this is actually a, a simulation we ran with uh, one of the uh, open source uh, AFC uh, solutions uh, to Gillette Stadium in Boston. They're a customer of uh, Extreme Networks. And using very uh, kind of liberal uh, um, <clears throat> levels of uncertainty, uh, we saw that the ones in yellow are not available um, uh, for an outdoor stadium, okay, uh, in this particular example. So this actually has a lot of interest to us. My company, we, uh, uh, we're in lots of stadiums and, of course, lots of other indoor, uh, outdoor and indoor verticals across the United States and the world. Um, there's going to be different, who the AFC providers are is actually another top, a huge topic of conversation. So we have one competitor that is thrown in completely with federated wireless. Uh, there's also an open source project called Open AFC, which is run by TIP, which is the same org that does the open Wi-Fi um, as well, but they have an open AFC um, uh, solution. And, um, you know, I, I'm not at liberty yet to say who we're throwing in with, but um, I'll just say this, uh, we're, we're talking to multiple people and so are our competitors. Now, right now this is just the United States. Um, there's been like nine different companies that have applied to be, a a 13 different companies that have applied to be AFC providers in the United States. We'll have to wait and see how this happens in the rest of the world as well once those rules are fleshed out, but there's um, Broadcom, Google, Wi-Fi Alliance might be an AFC provider. A lot of different people have all applied and there's gonna be some conditional approval for all of this um, uh, shortly. And then hopefully this all, some of the rules are still being fleshed out and will hopefully this all be in place and be operational by Q of two of next year. And then hopefully uh, if we have success in the United States, we can bring it over here as well. But once again, we're at the uh, uh, whim of the re regulators. Now, when I was in Phoenix, with a bunch, some of you um, back in February, I think uh, the question was how many six gigahertz clients? And I think at the time there was about 60 laptops and about six smartphones. Since February, there, there are now over 650 laptops that have six gigahertz capabilities, mainly using the Intel chipsets, and now 60 smart plus smartphones. So the, um, the client populations are growing exponentially and will continue to um, pretty much. The next thing, everybody's going to say, well, what happened to Apple? I don't know, call Tim Cook. But um, the, at the end of the day, let's hope uh, Apple comes. I mean, trust me, Apple is heavily involved in all the task groups and, and uh, regulatory lobbying and stuff. They'll have something. They just don't consult David Coleman. So um, now, um, so let's hope next year. Uh, but pretty much uh, moving forward, uh, most devices are going to have six gigahertz radios. Now, IoT, do you think there's going to be a six gigahertz IoT device anytime soon? No. Um, I did find out earlier in this week, there's, you know, you, there's, you have the data collection devices that are used in manufacturing. There's very, very major manufacturer that you're all familiar with that is, uh, uh, has some coming out as well. I believe they're in the room, but I, I'm not going to mention their name. But um, so what I'm saying is clients, they're growing and they're growing fast, but obviously there's still 15 billion clients that only operate in 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Now let's get into some of the technical aspects of this. Um, and uh, this is one of the things that a lot of people have uh, a hard time uh, uh, wrapping their head around. And I know this has been talked about before, but let's review it. And that is the whole way that clients discover APs. Before, it's always been in-band, and we've always used a probing mechanism. And clients send probe requests, um, and then they get probe response, and it's a way to, it's a hunt and seek method to go find APs that to potentially roam to. And then you can build this roaming table right here, and then based on whatever RF metrics, uh, SNR, RSSI, clients will then make the roaming decision. So it's all about discovery of potential roaming partners, and it's done via probing. This all goes out for the most part out the window in six gigahertz. And the reason is there's too many channels. There are 59 potential 20 megahertz channels. 
Management frames have to go on a primary channel. They can, do not go on bonded channels. So that's a 20 megahertz channels. Now, think what would happen to your Android if it was probing 59 channels. What's going to happen in the battery? Okay, yeah, it's going to be drained. Additionally, okay, not only that, um, you think they're going to be able to probe and see all APs and, and doing um, off-channel scanning, and you, they're going to miss APs. And so roaming is going to be negatively impacted. So uh, the goal was to, to try to eliminate uh, in-band discovery as almost entirely and probing almo almost entirely and go to the out-of-band discovery method, bringing back a, a information element called the reduced neighbor report, which will be in beacons and probe response frames. So now clients will still be probing on the 5 gigahertz band and the 2.4. We'll just use 5 as the example right here. So here's a client probe on channel 36, 40, and 44, finds out about all the five gigahertz radios and the security and their QoS mechanism, but the APs go, thought you should know, there is also a six gigahertz radio housed in this access point. Thought you should know that, and uh, if it's a Wi-Fi 6E or six gigahertz capable client, it'll be able to read that information and build a known AP table <laughs> of six gigahertz and hopefully potentially connect to those instead because there's a lot more channels and frequency space. Not to mention a clean RF environment. I, we saw some, some other presenters show you how clean it is right now. Um, you don't have the backward compatibility that you have to deal with. So. Um, but the whole out-of-band discovery is, is, this is how, this is the primary and mandated way, I should say, that clients have to find APs. The mandated way. And if clients don't support this, they're not compliant. Okay? And trust me, if clients aren't doing this, it ain't going to work. And we've seen weird stuff like that in the beginning in first-generation drivers. Uh, this is actually what one looks like, okay? So you can see the channel number is the primary channel of the 6 gigahertz channel. Uh, the operating class is an indication of the channel size. Operating class of 134 means uh, 160 megahertz channel. I can't remember what the values are for the other ones. It's Go read Wi-Fi 6E for dummies. Um, but uh, there's different values for the different channel sizes. The short SSID is the SSID of in 6 gigahertz. Uh, that's a hash, OK? Um, that, that's actually a hash. And you can see um, that's co-located in the AP. And there's some other metrics. The next thing people ask me is, can the SS, does the SSID have to be the same as it is in 5 gigahertz? The answer is no, it does not. And there's actually some implications for that, whether you're using the same SSID or not. And I will circle back to that when we get a little bit more into design here in a few minutes. Okay? But it's an out-of-band discovery method. Okay? Um, and uh, the next question I always get asked is, well, how many SSIDs can I relay out of band? Um, I think it's a chipset uh, limitation. And uh, the testing we did with Broadcom that's in our APs is eight. Uh, we found that we could have eight. So you could have as many as eight SSIDs. I know that sounds like a lot, but um, uh, we typically like less SSIDs. But uh, for um, I think there's going to be a lot of creative things doing, uh, design things where you might have uh, using different SSIDs for different applications. So believe it or not, we might actually see more SSIDs in 6 gigahertz. It just depends on uh, the customer requirements. But um, <clears throat> once again, you can uh, relay that information. Uh, even for roaming, so let's say this client is associated to this AP on channel 53, um, and uh, it'll still for, uh, do probing out of band. And it's probing out of band on 5 gigahertz and 2.4 gigahertz, even though it's associated to 6 gigahertz, and it will find out about other ro potential roaming neighbors by probing out of band. So the roaming, uh, once again, building those roaming tables is uh, important, uh, and it will be done out of band even while you're still associated to 6 gigahertz. Now, the next question is, how are the clients going to make the roaming decision? Because there's no RSSI or RF metrics that are delivered in the r, &R report. So how do they make that decision? Well, there's still an, an in-band discovery method that I'm going to talk about. But I will say this, and uh, I think this is extremely important. I don't think I emphasize this enough in Phoenix. 8 or 211K is going to be extremely important, OK? Because uh, for a way for the APs to inf uh, inform the clients about potential roaming neighbors, and uh, 8 or 211V for a certain extent as well. 
Okay, so 802.11k k is going to be very, very important in my mind. Okay, um, now um, moving on, there is uh, three potential uh, in-band methods that you might have heard about. Uh, the standards and the um, and certifications say simply this: the in-band methods are only supposed to be used for one thing. If you only have a six gigahertz radio in the AP, now. Who's going to build something like that? S somebody will. Um, but, uh, or I guess you could turn off the 2.4 or 5 gigahertz radio in the access point, and then effectively you have that, and you can use these in-band methods. Two of them are passive. I'm not going to talk about those. Okay? The one I'm going to talk about is this one, because we have decided as a company to turn it on by default, and I also know that one of our major competitors has done the exact same thing. Okay? Um, we view this as a backup to the out-of-band discovery. Okay, and it's called act. It's called PSC, preferred scanning channels. And effectively, what a client can do is still do a little bit of probing. The client, by the way, is not mandated to support this, and not all clients do this. Okay, but the, for the ones that do, they'll still be using out of band discovery. But then they can use this as well, especially once they're already in uh, in the band, to effectively probe every fourth channel. Okay, um, every fourth 20 megahertz channel. And that'll still be fine for discovering like 80 megahertz channels because you can see um, the PSC channel um, uh, will also um, uh, be assigned uh, on when you have a channel bonding as well. Now, this gets a little complex, okay? And this is not required, this is not mandatory, so not all clients will support this. I view this as a backup mechanism, but let's get into a discussion. This has implications for like the next 10 slides I'm gonna talk about, okay? So number one, uh, there's all the channels, okay? And there's where the preferred scanning channels are, okay? Now, another thing that, and the preferred scanning channels, as you can see, also align with half of the 40 megahertz channels, um, all of the 80 megahertz channels, and all of the 160, let's, hopefully you're not using those, but bottom line is using preferred scan, uh, this, you know, every, scanning every fourth channel, you can still find about, about all the 80s and 160s, and half of the 40s. Now, a requirement for the preferred scanning channels is that it also must be the primary channel. Now, you don't have to turn this on. We have this on by default, but if it's the preferred scanning channel, it also has to be the primary channel where your management frames are gonna be on. Now, does anybody see anything different as opposed to uh, where the location is of the primary, uh, since it's the primary channel, as opposed to five gigahertz? It's the second, it's not the first. Okay, and so that's gonna have some implications I'm gonna talk about in just a minute. Secondly, I want you to note that it's not, there is no PSC for every other 40 megahertz channel, and that's gonna be very important for uh, Europe because you're gonna be using 40 megahertz channels at least for now here in Europe. So the PSC is only gonna work for half the channels for you right off the bat. Once again, the out-of-band discovery is important, especially here in Europe. Now, I started thinking about this, and this is what I presented in Phoenix. I'm gonna to try to go through this a uh, little fast so I can hit some of the newer stuff. But, um, you know, uh, and it has to do with primary and secondary OBSS interference, um, which used to be a problem in five gigahertz, starting with um, 802.11n. So if you think about the clear channel assessment, there's basically two methods in the clear channel assessment. There's the signal to detect, which is a, a or sometimes called the preamble detect, which is a method of detecting um, uh, 80211 preamble bits and uh, trans radio transmissions. And then there's the energy to detect to detect any other RF transmissions. And there's different thresholds. The signal to detect, uh, and th there's those thresholds right there. Now it changed between 80211N and AC. So, and it also had implications when you were doing channel bonding. So with 802.11n, um, and by the way, I should back up here a second. The, the understanding of how all this works, it's kind of vague in the standard. And then over the years, including a lot of us here in this room, had it, had it all wrong. And still to this day, I contend that a lot of the uh, uh, r r client drivers don't have it particularly correct either, okay? But bottom line is the signal to 
architect is typically about 4 dB above the noise floor, um, which is your 8 or 2 11 preamble detect. Your energy detect is the signal detect plus 20 dB higher. But look at uh, secondary uh, channels if you're doing channel bonding in 5 gigahertz. There is no signal detect, and then the energy detect was a static number. Um, now, that had implications. Number one, you had no carrier sense on the secondary channel, so you couldn't detect the pre preamble, and the energy detect, that threshold was often too high to detect RF interference. So bottom line is, if you had mismatched primary channels on a 40 megahertz and five gigahertz, guaranteed collisions and data corruption and your throughput Trust me. And we saw this a lot in the early days of 8 or 2 11 in. Now, it got a little bit better with AC. With AC, they uh, set um, at least a threshold now for signal detect. Um, and, but we still had problems, OK? It was kind of a high. And look, and if you mix the primary and secondary channels, you're still going to have data, data corruption. So the bottom line was, um, what do you do when you design for 40 megahertz and 5 gigahertz? Your primary channel should always be that first channel, right? And, but it was kind of messed up because some vendors' RRM protocols got it all wrong, and then they gave you the ability to change it. It was an easy fix. The fix was just make the first channel the primary. Okay, and so this hasn't been too much of a problem um, in five gigahertz because the vendors figured it out and most of you guys figured it out, um, but the problem's coming back. So here is a hundred, this is a, um, a screen capture of a consumer uh, a grade access point and they're doing it right for a 160 megahertz channel um, right here. And then there's a competitive consumer grade and look what they're doing, okay? So uh, first of all, it's 160 megahertz, wonderful. But look what happens, okay, if they're in the same physical area. I guarantee you, because um, that's their PSC channel that they're using, but they made the PSC channel also the primary channel, okay? That, um, well, one of them is the PSC channel. The other one, it, they're not using PSC. They just made the first channel the primary channel. They're stepping on each other, and your throughput is going to go down, down, down. Same thing if you're doing this. If you're using that, if you have PSC on, and the second channel is the primary channel, which it doesn't have to be the primary channel. It only does if you have PSC on, which we're, most people are going to turn on by default. You have half the 40, if you still have half the 40 megahertz channels that don't have a PSC. So if you have an 80 megahertz design next to a, a 40 megahertz, there's a potential for half the 40 megahertz channels to do this. Same thing you're gonna have OBSS interference. So we did some baseline testing, uh, very simple, uh, with some APs uh, back in February. Uh, there's an 80 megahertz with no 40 megahertz traffic. There's the throughput, um, or the data. Uh, um, there is, uh, uh, when we had uh, turned on uh, a 40 megahertz channel with the primaries aligned, Okay, and the throughput went down, but that's okay because that's medium contention. The 40 and the 80 were sharing it, okay? So if you added it up, it went back to that number. Um, then, um, so the, they were aligned, the primaries were aligned, so everything's, everybody's happy. But then if we use like this other 40 megahertz channel that had, had the primary right here, and it doesn't align with the primary that's right here, which is guaranteed to happen if you're using all the 40 megahertz channels and you have a neighbor nearby, um, guess what? See what happens to the throughput on the 80 megahertz traffic. It's crushed, okay? We saw the exact same thing um, with 40 megahertz baseline, there's the 40 megahertz, that's the baseline. Um, when they're aligned and you mix 40 and 80, it goes down a little bit, but that's okay because they're aligned, okay? But if they're not aligned, you see that the 40 megahertz throughput goes down as well um, due to the OBSS interference. Now, this also has implications here in Europe because you're not going to be using 80 for now. Hopefully, you will when you get more frequency space. But... Um, if, if somebody turns on an 80 or a 160 nearby you and you're using all 40 megahertz, um, uh, you're guaranteed to have o OBSS interference. So, um, and by the way, my advice, uh, even though you do not have PSC channels on every other 40 megahertz channel here in Europe, um, my advice is that you still make the second channel um, your primary channel. Let's just get into that best practice wherever you are at in the world. 
okay? Um, make that a best practice. Now, you guys have probably heard about securities different as well, and this has implications. WPA3 is mandated, there is no WPA2. There's no open networks as well. Um, there's, um, uh, meaning there's no PSK, you have to use SAE or you can use OWE. Don't, um, I prefer you use SAE or, or 802.1x with management frame protection. But here's the implications. Um, there's no WPA2, okay? Stronger security is a good thing. But how many people in this room are using WPA3 in the legacy bands? Few. Um, it's, do you know what the adoption rate is right now? It's like well under 10%, closer to 5 Okay, and, there, and, and the reason is there are the transition modes. There is something known as backward compatibility. Has anybody turned on WPA3 and tell me what happened to the legacy clients, some of them? They break, okay? Not all of them, but some of them. So even though we all know we've seen this for a lot of different things, when new features and new capabilities come on, backward compatibility sounds great, but it doesn't necessarily always pan out. So um, most people roll back to WPA2. So our guidance for now is you're gonna be using different uh, levels of security. You're gonna be using WPA3 level strength security on six gigahertz and WPA2 on uh, five gigahertz and 2.4, which means different SSIDs. Now has, this has different implications. What are you gonna do about guest networks? If a lot of them are open, I'd prefer they not be open, but most of them are open. So more than likely guest traffic is gonna stay in the legacy bands, okay? Now, you guys saw James from NetAlley yesterday and he was talking about the problems of the inner band roaming, about how the clients right now um, will get connected to six, and then, uh, but then when they roam, they go to back to five and they prefer five, and that has to do a lot with the signal strength. We've seen the exact same thing, and so has our competitors. But if you do this, there is no interband roaming, right? So um, eventually, we're going to want interband roaming, and eventually, we're going to want to be able to have the stronger security. But right now, that kind of solves that problem, okay, um, with the interband roaming, because you're not going to have it. Now, you could do a mix, right? You could have. You could have a WPA3 SSID on both bands, but, and then still also have a WPA2 SSID. There's gonna be a lot of weird SSID and a lot more segmentation uh, of devices by frequency um, using different security, and also possibly for the problems with interband roaming as well. I will say this, let's just say we had a magic wand and WPA3 worked in, uh, for all clients in five and 2.4, and you could uh, do uh, the inner band roaming, you're still gonna have that problem with maybe some of the stickiness to five gigahertz, which is why you will see vendors uh, on both the client side and the AP side um, start building in some band steering capabilities. Um, so, I mean, we haven't done it yet, but we're thinking about it. So are our competitors. And if you remember historically, remember historically when band steering happened from 2.4 to 5, every vendor did it on the APs, right, first. And we all said, turn it on. But then what, did, what started happening? What did the clients start doing? The clients started uh, building in secret sauce so that they would uh, prefer five instead of 2.4. And so we, we actually went back and in most cases turned off the band steering. So we kind of, we're hoping we'll see more client intelligent, but what do we know with first generation drivers with clients for anything? What, what's our experience? Okay, it's usually not a happy day and it takes time. So, but I think you'll see some creative band steering things done, but that also still is dependent on the fact that um, you may have to have a WPA3 SSID on both bands, multiple bands, and then still have a legacy WPA2 band, uh, SSID on the legacy band. So it's gonna get a little, little interesting. Uh, WIPs is gonna be more and more important uh, because now you have new rogue APs um, and six gigahertz. And I will also say, um, there will, uh, trust me, the hackers, they'll probably come up with creative six gigahertz only attacks. So WIPs, I hope, will make a, a more and more of a comeback and vendors that have tried sensor scanning capabilities uh, will take the lead. Also, you could use legacy sensors to detect the R&R &R information element um, and uh, um, so still be able to detect it, detect it out of band, but um, it's not, never as good as in-band scanning. Now let's get a little bit into design. So we'll start with wired. So 
Guys, I'm not going to get into this. Everybody's been hearing, yeah, you need 10 gigabit uplinks. We started hearing that, you know, what, 10 years ago. We know that's not true. I use this as an opportunity to remind everybody that bottlenecks are rarely at the access layer. They're almost always at the WAN uplink. Will you need 10 gigabit uplinks? No. But will you need 2.4 or 5? Um, will you need multi-gig? Um, probably not yet, OK. And I know that if I say, yeah, future proofing, you should think about doing it anyway, you're all going to throw eggs at me. But I don't know if anybody caught a video of Intel and Broadcom that they did a, a, a controlled demo of Wi-Fi 7. But they did a controlled demo about a month ago. And there's a video on YouTube that shows 5 gigabits per second Wi-Fi with Wi-Fi 7. So um, think of this as a future-proofing thing. I'm not going to tell you you need to upgrade to multi-gig. Multi-gig is becoming pretty standard now anyway. This is not, when I talk to my own salespeople, I tell them don't lead with this. When you're talking about 6 gigahertz, this is what you need to be talking about, PoE. That's a rebooting AP right there, because if it doesn't get enough power, it's going to reboot. It's the number one support call we get at extreme networks, and I dare say, same with our competitors, OK? It's the number one support call. So here's the thing. The days of, of 802.3 AF are over. 15 watts isn't going to hack it. You're going to need 25 watts minimum, even for the tri-frequency 2 by 2 by 2s to get full Wi-Fi functionality. Same thing now, there's 4 by 4 by 4s You're going to need, in most cases, for full functionality, BT power, 32 watts or higher. Okay. Now, everybody has downgrade capabilities. So a lot of vendors are going to say, oh, they're 4x4x4, four by four by four, Wi-Fi 6E, a tri-frequency APs can work with AT power. OK? And that's true. Almost everybody's going to have some way to do that. But you have to turn off things. OK? I'll tell you how Extreme does it. We turn off a USB port, and we turn off a secondary PoE out port. And but we maintain full Wi-Fi radio chain functionality, four and full, full, all four by fours on all three bands. I think we have one competitor that can do the same thing. Where everybody else, what do you think they're doing? They're turning off MIMO um, radio chains, and they're downgrading to a two by two. So I know this is a little bit of a shameless plug, but I'm just saying, uh, be careful. Um, uh, you know, you're either going to need the, uh, the BT power, but also check out what your downgrade capabilities are as well. And at the end of the day, um, remember that um, the days of PoE, standard PoE, are over. You're going to need more power. So um, you're going to have to, you know, a couple people have said you not, I think, Francois was, said this, that you, you're not just a Wi-Fi guy. You've got to be a networking guy and gal, right? So you've got to understand that. And wired integration is important. OK. Um, let's get into channel reuse. In the United States, we absolutely think 80 megahertz is going to be um, used quite a bit because we've got all that frequency space. So I can't even, like I said uh, in Phoenix, I can't even believe I'm saying this, that 80 megahertz design is going to become common. Not everywhere, but it'll be common in the United States. And a lot of it has to do with the power spectral density rules. Um, it's actually advantageous to use wider channels. You can see that your actual EIRP actually goes up when you do channel bonding. And um, uh, the noise floor still rises, OK? Um, and you're st um, but in the problem with that in 5 gigahertz when you did channel bonding, when the noise floor ri rises when you bond a channel, is your SNR dropped. Uh, by raising the power right here, effectively what we can uh, accomplish here is the noise floor still rises. But what we can accomplish now is we can keep that SNR co consistent. And by keeping the SNR consistent, um, we can... Um, uh, we can offset that rise in the noise source. So it'll actually be advantageous to use wider channels. Now, you are not going to use 80 megahertz here in Europe. You just don't have enough frequency space. So for now, uh, indoors, 40 megahertz, but lobby your regulatory bodies and let's get the rest of the frequency space. Let's get that spectrum harmonization and then 80 megahertz can be your friend as well. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, uh, the range is always a big discussion. And uh, so you know, there's only a 2 dB difference in the free space path loss in between 5 and 6. And you, I hear different people with different opinions on this. But you, know, you hear about one-to-one -one replacements, OK? One-to-one -one replacements. So my, 
let's, have one-to-one -one replacements historically ever been a good idea? Okay, no, they haven't. So you will hear some marketing from vendors that say, yeah, one-to-one -one replacement, sure, no problem. You know, it's just rip it out, rip it in, put it up, done. Every deployment's different. One-to-one -one replacements might work in, uh, um, you know, carpeted office space, or maybe even if you have an AP in every room, like K through in some K through 12, like Keith likes so much. But um, the uh, at the end of the day, it's probably not a good idea. Um, so here's uh, AP 4000, five gigahertz coverage. Uh, there's six gigahertz, five, six, five, six, and I can simulate this on multiple tools. Um, you know, it's our advice is it's carpeted office space in AP every other room. Probably, probably you might be able to pull it off, but look, the answer is simple, guys. I don't need to preach to this community. Design, validate. It's that simple. You know, that doesn't change. Um, and it's going to be different with six gigahertz. Um, other uh, coverage considerations, too, and range considerations, too. Uh, in the United States, we are definitely, seeing, because of the 6 dB difference, we're definitely seeing a uh, better range on the downlink than on the uplink in most cases. Uh, with the, the European rules are a little bit different, so that probably won't be as much as an impact because there's not that 6 dB difference. But um, keep that in mind as well, okay? Um, you know, I've always thought range is an outdated concept. It's more about density, but uh, I mean, we got to think about it, right? So design and validate. Um, when I was in Phoenix uh, back six months ago, I think the only thing that could do six gigahertz was Adrian's tool, okay? And um, uh, which he led the way, even though there's still not a six gigahertz radios in MacBooks, but you can import packet captures and it can talk to remote sensors. And I think it was the WLAN Pi Pro and that was it. Um, go read this blog. I wrote this back in August. Um, since then, we have lots of wonderful toys, okay, that have six gigahertz. So I commend all the vendors here in the room. The Echo House sidekick is an engineering marvel, okay? Um, I'm hoping one will fall off a truck in front of my house one day. Um, the air check is, is also uh, just a, a wonderful tool. And then lots of um, all the design tools have all come into play, as well as some of the, um, you know, even some of the cheap and freeware things that are on Android. So uh, think about it historically. Keith, do you remember what, how we used to do spectrum and, and probably a lot of you, what did we used to use that, that, that little frequency hopper PCMCIA card that we used to do, we used to use as a crude spectrum analyzer. We didn't have anything back in like 2003 and 2004. We just didn't have any, any toys. And you guys have lots of toys and tools at your disposal, and that's a good thing, okay? And, um, and I'm sure um, all the vendors, including, the, we have three or four of them here in this room, they will uh, learn new things and enhance their products as well. So, um, and you know, having that feedback loop from this community to, to these vendors um, is a good thing. Now, let me tell you something about this that we kind of found out. So this happened a couple weeks ago, and um, I thought, kind of thought about this, but it kind of, I, I lost it in the, in the fog of my mind is we had a customer call up and they were using an Echo House Sidekick and uh, they were also using some other clients and they were freaking out over the RSSI difference um, uh, between five gigahertz and six gigahertz. And I just showed you there's only a two d uh, dB uh, path loss. And they saw it consistently in all the tools. They started with the sidekick. They thought the sidekick was broken. Then they saw it on all the uh, it, sidekicks not broken. Then they saw it on other tools. And so they said, your APs suck, OK, right? So, but that's not the problem, OK? Um, and here's the you know, same thing. You're seeing kind of the same thing. Now I'll come back to that slide. Now, it has to do with passive scanning, OK? And this is going to be more, uh, uh, so it has to do with passive scanning. So uh, with, when you do channel bonding now, what do you do with your power? You raise your power, right? Your power from the AP actually goes up, okay? And you saw that in a previous slide. What, <clears throat> when you do passive scanning, what are they listening to? Beacons, or they could be they're beacons, or they could be probing, getting probe responses. What size channel is that on? 20 megahertz. See where I'm going with this? 
the RSSI transmission from the APs is, and the EIRP, it's going to be a lot lower than what the, the active transmissions on the full bonded channels. So um, that's why they were seeing this. Now, so, um, so we immediately kind of figured this out. And uh, when I was in Sweden last week, I saw the VP of product, uh, develop, uh, product for Ekahal, and we, we had this discussion. And uh, in Ekahal, I, mean, I believe, gentlemen, correct me if I'm wrong, but what they're going to do is they're going to do an offset, right, for the, the passive capabilities. Right, so, and so you're going to have an offset to end it. Or if you're doing active, which is what I think you saw with James when he was uh, demoing right now, then you're going to get the true RSSI of, of the active. Okay, so bottom line is you can visualize it right here. There's that, uh, 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 an Android tool. You can see the RSSI uh, as passive right there is 54 d dBm. But then when they're connected and sending data, and in both cases they were using uh, um, this is the 20 megahertz channel, but then it was connected and using the full bonded channel right there, you see the RSSI goes right up. So think about that. Active surveys might actually make a little bit of a comeback, but, or just be aware of what your tool is doing. And if it's uh, only passive, that there needs to be some sort of offset built in the tool. I had the same discussion with a couple, uh, several different vendors, but I can promise you there's going to be a bunch of tools that haven't thought about this yet. Okay, um, and so you actually effectively what you have then is you you have like an association coverage, but also a data coverage. So your beacons aren't in your in the the capabilities of where you where or where you may not hear beacons and stuff. It may not be it, the effective range might not be the same as your data coverage. Make sense? Okay. That's, um, so you know, that, that's what's cool and fun about this industry. We learn something new every, every day, you know? And we're just beginning with six gigahertz, and I think in this room we're gonna learn a lot more. So that's why I wanna challenge everybody to think about out-of-the-box design and strategies. I did the same thing in Phoenix. Think about out-of-the-box design strategies, okay? Um, and and come, to the next, come back to Prague a year from now and tell us what you did. Okay, um, tell us, um, did you put different applications on different channels? Did you, not just by frequency, maybe by uh, band and six gigahertz or channels. Um, uh, I've had lots of different suggestions. I don't, want to, I don't have the time to get into it, but may, I would love to see somebody uh, just do a presentation next year on you know, five different ways to design the six gigahertz. I don't want to have to do it, so somebody else do it. Um, there will be indoor challenges due to LBI rules because you don't have the weatherized enclosure and you don't have the detachable antennas. So this is a big reason why vendors like Extreme and quite frankly, all our competitors are aligned with us on this. Are we are lobbying very, very heavily um, for, to make sure that we can use standard power indoors as well. And we think a Wi-Fi 7 will drive more and more and more use cases of standard power as well. So there will be potential use cases for standard power indoors, not just outdoors. So Wi-Fi 7. OK, you guys don't know, you know, it seems like every three years we get a new one. Uh, when's Wi-Fi 7 coming? Well, Wi-Fi 7 is not a thing. Did you know that? It, there is no Wi-Fi 7. Wi-Fi 7 is the name of a certification. The Wi-Fi Alliance has announced their intention um, to come up with a certification. I know when they may actually have that go live, but I'm not allowed to talk about it, okay? Um, but they're working on it, okay? Um, but it's not a thing. But actually, it is a thing, because um, every chipset vendor in the world has already announced, including Broadcom, which is what's in extreme APs, and also in a lot of smartphones. Qualcomm is already being, there. If, if you see all the marketing from our friends at Broadcom and Qualcomm, you would think there is no such thing as Wi-Fi 6E, okay? I think we get too caught up in these naming conventions. I tell everybody, don't say 6E or 7, say 6 gigahertz. That's what, that's what should be coming out of your mouth. But Wi-Fi 7 is coming sooner than you think. Uh, in Sweden, the v, uh, very senior VP of Qualcomm got up and said that we expect to see Wi-Fi 7 smartphones, two of them, in Q1 of next year. You will see consumer-grade Wi-Fi 7 stuff before the certification is available next year. Okay? Um, 
don't hold me to this, and I'll deny I said this even if it's, though it's on video, okay? Um, uh, you'll probably see enterprise grade uh, APs starting in uh, Wi-Fi 7 in 2024. Uh, whether they're certified or not, that's another thing, okay? Um, but um, uh, it's coming. Now, uh, we already had a presentation on this, 320 megahertz channels, woo-hoo, okay? You know how many you get in Europe right now? One, yeah, yeah, wow. Um, also, um, you hear about 4K QAM, you know? So once again, to back up uh, previous speakers, uh, it's all about SNR. You need about 28 SNR right here. You need, uh, I believe, 35 SNR to get 102 4 QAM. Now you're gonna need SNR 41. So as long as you're on six gigahertz, there's no noise in your right here. Fine, consumer grade feature, consumer grade feature. Consumer grade feature. You're gonna hear, uh, these are gonna be marketed like crap. Oh, and by the way, every, in Europe, every single consumer grade AP will have that on by default. <laughs> okay. So be ready, and, uh, and by the way, that will also cause OBSS interference with your entire band. Okay, isn't that fun? Okay, now, um, the thing that holds the most promise is the multi-link operation. Think multiple bands, multiple channels, um, and there's um, uh, where you can um, establish a multi-link association. There's different methods. It can be link aggregation, link steering, or link redundancy with different goals. The aggregation is higher throughput, the uh, uh, latency, the link steering is for latency, uh, redundancy is for latency and reliability. I personally believe the link steering is the one that's probably gonna work at least initially, but we'll see. I never believe anything till it's field tested. Um, that, but once again, the data aggregation is what if you could have uh, two links, maybe an 80 and a 40 at the same time on two different bands, you could aggregate your data, your throughput goes way up. If you had the redundant, um, you have duplicate data, um, uh, uh, and in case any of that data gets corrupted, no big deal because you have duplicates and that's gonna increase your reliability and also enhance latency. Now, both of these methods sound great, but I have my doubts. I think Medca gave a presentation in Phoenix where it's actually shown there's been some data that shows it's all about medium contention. So what if six gigahertz is clear and free and five gigahertz is real busy? How do you synchronize this? You know, um, you know, we're talking microseconds, but if uh, if the the wait time it, um, for the synchronization to do the redundancy or the aggregation of the um, uh, for two across two bands is the wait times too long due to medium contention, it'll actually have a negative impact. So the one that I think is going to have the most impact is this one. Um, it's the uh, link steering, where maybe you, uh, both uplink and downlink, uh, you're listening on both bands, but you're constantly going back and forth transmitting, whether uplink or downlink, um, on the band uh, that is the clearer and the cleanest, or the, the first one that's available. And by doing that, that'll also lower latency. You're hearing marketing claims of new latency, of 10 times better latency. Okay, um, but, but it will be better latency as well, and you're not gonna get 46 gigabits per second. Okay, that's the other thing too, but um, I, the latency is gonna be important. I know you hear a lot of marketing hype about AR and VR. That stuff's real, guys. That's coming. It's, I've, I've been involved with some things recently, including a VR video shoot. I th especially AR, I think you're gonna um, see a lot of innovation in the coming 10 years. And, uh, and a lot of this is gonna go over wireless. Um, and uh, latency is gonna be important for both those technologies. Um, so a lot of work's being done uh, specifically. Uh, there will be a whole new Mac layer. There's gonna be an upper layer Mac that has a Mac address that is specific to the, uh, to the MLO link. Uh, and then the lower Mac is, will still be the Mac addresses of your radios. Um, that'll work just the same. The upper Mac is used to report up to the higher layers. There's this new multi-link element um, where, uh, that is used in the Beacon and Probus to do a discovery and setup. So basically the client says, hey, I'm a, I can do multiple links and multiple bands. The AP says, I can do it as well. Let's use these channels, these radios. And then it builds a MAC address that is only used in the upper MAC. Now let me tell you why that's cool. That MAC address that is used in the upper MAC, what do you think that seeds? 
the four-way handshake. And by seeding the four-way handshake, now you can use a single PTK across all three bands. So now if you do inner band roaming, um, you actually have to do a four-way handshake each time. You can eliminate that because you can use that across all two bands. So for geeks and me, that's cool. Okay, so <laughs> um, I'm not gonna get into all the different types because I'm running out of time, but uh, uh, there's like four or five different methods. The one that I think will be used the, one, the most is this, enhanced multi-link single radio, especially on the client side. Think a two by two by two client that is listening with one radio chain on five gigahertz, uh, one on six gigahertz, and then depending on which is clearer, we'll transmit with both radio chains on five or both with six, but not at the same time. That link steering I was talking about, that's what I think we'll, we'll see effectively at first. There's gonna also be some security enhancements and this will be important as well because any power saving mechanisms that we have are going to be, have to be link aware whether it's TIM, DTIM, um, TWT, they're gonna have to be link aware and not um, for all the radios that are being used in the multi-link association. Um, and um, I'm out of time, so I, I'll just wrap this up here. Uh, you're 16 by 16 by 16, come on. Um, and I also think Wi-Fi 7 will drive uh, outdoor use and automated frequency coordination even further on, and ho hopefully. Guys, to wrap this up, I also understand that there's the update grade fatigue. And I just wanna use, I know, uh, this opportunity to say this. Uh, there's a couple of analysts out there. There's first one in February telling everybody, uh, don't buy Wi-Fi 6E because of supply chain, buy the old stuff. And that was totally ridiculous because it's actually easier to get the newer chips than it is the older chips in a lot of cases. Now there's another analyst out there right now that is going and telling, don't, buy Wi-Fi 5 because it's cheaper, all right? That may be true, but what are you doing if you make that recommendation? What are you doing if you say, tell your company, you're, up for, you're due for an upgrade, buy Wi-Fi 5 right now. What happens to that customer for the next five years? They do not have six gigahertz. So you're not future-proofing that customer. So with all due respect to that analyst, that is bad advice in my mind because six gigahertz is the future. Okay, and I'll, I'll go back to this uh, again. All future versions of Wi-Fi are dependent on six gigahertz. There's no multi-leak operation without six gigahertz. Wi-Fi seven, eight, nine, I'll be retired or dead by then. But when, it, when those happen, six gigahertz will be a big part of that. Uh, there's the shameless plug for the dummies booklet. Um, as usual, guys, um, we'll see about a Wi-Fi 7 for dummies, you know. Um, uh, thanks for that, Keith. And finally, I'll end this with this. This is my favorite quote. I stole it from Rosalie Babano, our senior WLAN product director who does the hardware. Uh, oh, and by the way, if for my competitors out there, if I find out that any of you are soliciting her to, for employment, I will hunt you down and kill you. Um, so um, that being said, she has the best quote of all. It's almost like Wi-Fi is being born again. So thank you very much.